Jojo de Quirico, 1888 to 1978, was an Italian artist born in Greece. In the years before World War I, he founded the Scuola Metaphysica um, art movement. I know it was terribly pronounced, I'm sorry about that, which profoundly influenced the Surrealists. His family relocated to Munich in 1906, where he entered the Academy of Fine Arts. Now, why am I talking about Giorgio de Chirico when I'm, I'm, the original idea was to talk about Matisse? And the thing is that without the work, the early works, I should say, of Giorgio de Chirico, Matisse may well not have produced what he did produce as a, a direct um, <clears throat> descendancy from, from the one to the other, as I shall show you. So I'm not going to dwell on de Chirico for too long. I'll show you a few of his paintings just to show you how that led into Matisse's work. And there's a picture of de, de Chirico as a young man. Um, looks a bit scruffy, doesn't he? In 1909, de Chirico returned to Italy and began to paint in a style dominated by flat surfaces, faithful to one colour and without shading. The following year, he moved to Florence where he painted what is called his metaphysical town square paintings. This one, as you can see, is called The Enigma of an Autumn Afternoon. Now, I've deliberately put the titles of all these paintings this morning above the paintings because uh, there's a health warning with these titles and you'll probably be scratching your heads already to work out why is that painting called The Enigma of an Autumn Afternoon. I wouldn't worry about it, these titles too much. I think that's the point. The point is that they don't really relate to anything. Usually they don't relate to anything in the painting is the whole point of them. Um, <clears throat> this one is in the Peggy Guggenheim um, Museum in Venice. So what have we got there? We've got a statue, a headless statue in, in, a, in a piazza, and uh, he's very fond of painting piazzas and arcades, as I'll come on to. We've got a, a sail of a boat in the background, if you can see, going behind the roofs of those um, hovels. And then these two strange figures who look to be, they look to be quite forlorn to me. And then we've got these, this strange building on the left with these um curtain these curtains on rails and we're going to see those again in a minute <clears throat> the years 1909 to 1917 are now referred to as his metaphysical period and it was these early pictures which so profoundly influenced the surrealist movement they're characterized by haunting brooding images strongly influenced by his reading of schopenhauer and particularly Nietzsche, who removed God from the world. God is tot, and wir haben ihn getötet, said Nietzsche famously. God is dead, and we have killed him. Like others who came after him, particularly the existential thinkers, de Chirico realized that if you remove all religious belief from human life, all you are left with is a void. Was this what he was attempting to explore through his art in glaring flat colors to evoke profound absurdity of the universe, the incongruent juxtaposition of recognizable objects where they would never be seen in actuality. This painting is called The Enigma of the Oracle and we get again have got these curtains on rails that we saw in the previous painting. There's obviously a wind blowing these, this one away. Uh, th this strange statue figure here, or he, uh, th that face to me suggests uh, a Victorian um, uh, statue actually. And yet this one um, is quite a sinister looking uh, character. I mean, it could, it could be trying to recreate the Sybil or Pythia or whatever, I don't know, we don't know. Uh, that's the whole point, we don't know. Um, this is quite a small painting actually, it's only 16 by 24, painted in 1910, and it's in a, um, a private collection. It's almost as though de Chirico is trying to create his own mythology, to create a sense of nostalgia, intense anticipation, 
and detachment. He wrote <clears throat> a host of strange, unknown and solitary things that can be tra translated into painting. What is required above all is a pronounced sensitivity. This next painting is called Melancholia, painted in 1916. This painting is in America, in Houston, America. De Kerico was profoundly moved by what he called the metaphysical aspect of the architecture of archways and piazzas. And he, he always has, he always seems to have them disappearing into the distance. So those, these don't go too far into the distance. He was particularly fond of steam trains. And you can see um, the steam train in the, in the back here. Um, and you'll see, you'll see more steam trains. You don't see much of these trains, but they sort of, they're sort of a, a light motif in, in some of his paintings. And you'll see one again in a moment. Uh, and of course, he was also, as I said, a fond of, of painting arcades and, and piazzas. Um, he, he wrote, the, the Roman arcade to him is fate. Its voice speaks in riddles, which are filled with a peculiarly Roman poetry. Not quite sure what he means by that. De Chirico moved to Paris in 1911 and in 1913 exhibited paintings at the Salon, where his work was noticed by Picasso and Apollinaire. This was about the time he sold his first painting, The Red Tower. This is quite a small painting too, 29 by 39 inches, and it's also uh, in the Guggenheim um, exhibition, um, Museum in, in Venice. And again, we've got the two um, arcades on either side. We've also got a cropped image of a statue here. We've, we've no idea who this statue is, um, but we've got a long shadow there. And, we've, and there's quite a lot of contrast in this painting, actually. Surrealists are fond of contrast. You know, they can, it, it, it accentuates the bright colors they like to use. His time in Paris also resulted in the painting of Ariadne in 1913. Uh, I'm not going to go into the myth of Ariadne because um, we, we saw enough of Ariadne in um, Titian's work, if you remember, when she was abandoned by Theseus and, and jumped on from a great height by, by Bacchus. But notice again, we've got the steam train in the background there. It's almost as though he's having a little snigger with himself, a little chuckle about that. And again, we've got the, the arcade disappearing into the distance. In the First World War, War, De Chirico was rejected from the army and assigned to hospital work. From 1918, his paintings were exhibited extensively throughout Europe, and more importantly, in the early 1920s, Andre Breton discovered his metaphysical paintings and was captivated by them. So that de Chirico's imagery became the focus of the Paris Surrealist group. But it was also about this time that de Chirico went in another direction altogether, adopting a more traditional classical style of which the Surrealists grew increasingly contemptuous. He quickly fell out with Breton, not with a little acrimony I might add, and said the Surrealist painters were cretinous and hostile. In 1939, he adopted a neo-Baroque style influenced by Rubens, but this later work never achieved the same critical praise as those from his metaphysical period. Nonetheless, he remained prolific up to his 90th year when he died in Rome. This is a self-portrait painted in 1911, and tellingly at the bottom uh, of the frame, He's sketched the, or he's, um, uh, he's, well, he's painted the words, the Latin word phrase, et quid amobo nisi quod enigma est. What shall I love if not enigma? So to sum up, De Chirico's best known works are the paintings from his metaphysical period, 1909 to 1911, when he developed this repertoire of incongruent images in empty, car in empty arcades, trains, and towers with elongated shadows. And his mannequins always seem to pass 
<clears throat> creating images of forlornness and emptiness. And so we come to the synaptic painting that links the two painters, De Chirico and René Magritte. As you can see, this is called the Song of Love, but I'm not sure where the love is in this poem, in this uh, painting. We've got this miserable looking classical um, mask or bas relief sculpture attached to a, 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 sh a strange shaped board. And we got a, and the surgical glove there, which has been nailed on, as you can see. Then we got that curious round green ball, and we'll see that again in Magritte's work. And if you look very carefully, just where I'm pointing now, yet again, we've got the steam train passing. It's not very obvious, but he sneaked it in there. And we've got the arcade here. Now, you might think, uh, uh, and it's already been expressed on the on the on the group site that this is a, a very strange painting and of course we have got a collection of incongruent objects that you wouldn't expect to see uh, in normal life and there's going to be inevitably uh, uh, a sort of temptation to try and make some sort of sense of it I will warn you against doing that but the point of this particular painting is that it's the painting that inspired Magritte to turn to surrealism. He described his first sighting of it in 1921, and it was actually painted in 1914 at the outbreak of the war. He described it as one of the most moving moments of my life. My eyes saw thought for the first time. Uh, and that seems to be an enigmatic um, thing to say anyway. His eyes saw thought for the first time. I don't know how many of you can see thought there. I hope some of you can. So that's a brief summary of Giorgio de Carico. And now we come on to the main act, as it were, which is René Magritte, born 1898, died in 1967. Magritte's relationship with other surrealist painters was not always good especially with Anton Breton. He firmly resisted all attempts to interpret his images as symbols of repressed fears and desires. Some of his early work certainly resonates of dreamscape, but his art generally appeals to the conscious mind in that its purpose, if it has one, seems to be to unnerve us, make us feel uneasy, and certainly to encourage us to scratch our heads. As I've implied, his style certainly derives from de Chirico, and just like de Chirico's early works, it is the art of the absurd, the art of the incongruent, and has little to do with a surrealist stream of consciousness. In fact, you could say Magritte pursued his own pictorial language in that interchangeable juxtaposed images are removed from their usual context only to find themselves in unfamiliar surroundings, as in this painting called The Difficult Crossing. Now, I think we can relate the title Difficult Crossing to that either picture or window in the back. It's not clear w what it is, but there's certainly a ship having, or ships having difficult crossings there. But then what on earth are all these other things in this picture? We've got this draped curtain at the top here. We've got these theater flats. I, I, I'm pretty sure that's what they are. Then we've got this turned wood. Um, um, I, I wanted to call it a figure, but I, it's hard to say what it actually is, but it's got an eye. So there's something anthropomorphic about it. And then on this table, which again has one leg as a shaped in the form of a, a woman's leg, I would say, a human leg, certainly. And we've got this hand on this table. Uh, I don't think we can think that we can, uh, I don't think this is supposed to be a severed hand. This is a, more of a sculpted hand, I think. Um, and then draped around this bird, whether the bird is alive or dead is difficult to say. And certainly this thumb is very, is painted in a very exaggerated way. So what is going on in this painting? I leave you to work it out for yourselves. 
I'm not going to attempt to explain it because I just couldn't. Magritte largely kept himself to himself, living a life of bourgeois anonymity. He needed to earn a living, of course. He loved classical music, read widely from philosophy to detective novels, and loved the cinema. He was, all, he was usually seen in public in a dark suit and a bowler hat, looking not unlike a bank manager, you might say. In fact, there's a lot of uh, archive footage of him strolling around Brussels dressed exactly like this. Um, whether this is deliberate uh, to put everybody off the paint, off the, off, off the, um, off the scent, in so much as he, he couldn't look less like a painter, could he? Whatever a painter looks like. Um, but whatever it is, anyway, this, this sort of uh, anodyne appearance masked a subversive temperament, a desire to challenge accepted ideas about reality. Almost unbelievably, Magritte never had a studio and preferred to paint in one corner of his living room. The Spirit of Geometry, painted in 1937, a small painting, 15 by 12, and this painting is in Tate Modern, actually, um, exchanges the heads of the mother with the baby, compressing one and enlarging the other. The effect is at once uncanny, threatening and risible. The paternal figure with the perm and the child with puffing cheeks are unsettling because despite their absurdity, they seem to bond. Again, we've got the curtain on the, um, on the left there. Yes, it is an unsettling painting. There's no two ways about it. Um, uh, 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 and, but uh, it's uh, hard to say any more about it than that, really. Um, and, ni and neither of these two faces are, are, seem to be aware of each other. They both seem to be fairly disengaged, it seems to me. Magritte spoke, and I quote, of his determination to make the most familiar objects scream aloud. The more familiar the object divorced from its natural habitat, the louder the scream. The smooth finish he applied to his brushwork suited his surrealist paintings, throwing incongruent objects into sharp relief and unsettling the viewer, as in this one, which is called Time Transfixed, painted in 1939 and hangs uh, uh, in Chicago. He deliberately affects this smooth poster-like style. He was a commercial artist for some time, as we'll come on to in a, in a, in a bit. And Marguerite rejected all psychological interpretations of his work, saying he simply wanted to paint a railway engine so that it would evoke mystery. He then had the idea of combining it with a dining room fireplace, a quite unrelated setting. Then there's the eponymous clock on the mantelpiece. Magritte had several clocks in his Brussels home, all set to chime slightly out of sync. Out of sync, I think that's an important phrase applied to well, all serialist paintings, really. Um, at least with this mirror, we've got a, 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 a reflection, which we don't always get in, in um, in Magritte's paintings. So despite people's attempts to work out what, why this painting should be called Time Transfixed, what does it mean, Time Transfixed, Magritte would answer, well, he just wanted to paint uh, a steam engine and he wanted to paint it in the most unlikely context coming out of a fireplace, an unlit fireplace, I might say. It looks as though this fireplace has never been lit, I, I, I would hasten to add. Magritte was born at Lacine in a French-speaking region of Belgium in 1898. Little is known about his early life other than his family was comfortably off and seemed to have moved around a lot before finally settling in Brussels in 1918 at the end of the First World War. However, prior to this, his mother had committed suicide in the River Sambre 
after several failed attempts in the same river. He never talked about it, but the dramatic effect is there sure enough in some of his pictures. She was found shrouded in her nightdress and the image of her swaddled face surfaces in such paintings as the heart of the matter. This was painted in 1928 and measures 32 by 46, it's still in Belgium. The presence of the tuba and the suitcase has no meaning, no reason to be painted, which is probably the point. The Lovers, painted in 1928, again we have shrouded faces. Magritte's ability to, co ability to convey abnormal physical and psychological states, i.e. anxiety, claustrophobia, panic, is one of the most distinctive features of his art. Magritte would often obliterate faces as if to question their identity. In this painting, he has detached the human element from the act of the embrace without alienating the sensuality. He has given us the kiss, but nothing but the kiss. In fact, the, if, you, if you look carefully at the painting, the creases in the, um, in, in the cloth that are shrouding the heads, they look more sculpted than painted. They're not, they're not painted as creases as such. I don't think. And strangely as well, we've got this architrave in this top right hand corner, which doesn't, doesn't continue over the, 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 back, the back wall. Uh, and, and, and for some reason, that, that's unsettling. It unsettles me anyway. But whatever he's trying to do in this um, painting, I think it succeeds in that even though he's tried to disguise the sensuality of it, it's still there, the, the actual act of the kiss. And one imagines the act of um, pleasure underneath those shrouded faces is still expressed. Magritte's first painting, loosely impressionistic, date, dates from 1916 when he enrolled in the Academy Beaux-Arts in Brussels. His attendance was sporadic and he left without a degree, something, something he has in common with Dali, by the way. In 1922, he married Georgette Berger, and there they are together, looking extremely happy, I would have thought, and for a year worked in a wallpaper factory as a designer, uh, painting at home in his spare time. In Brussels, where his pictures were occasionally exhibited, he mixed with the avant-garde, particularly poets, musicians, and writers, but significantly never painters. As I've said, he developed a style where the surfaces of his paintings were smoothly finished, giving a slick appearance. This one is called The Bather, painted in 1925, and it's uh, 20 by 39, and like many of Magritte's paintings, they are in a private collection, so we don't know where they are. In many ways, this is a transitional work, the colours flat and the pastel shades and the architecture reduced to basic geometric patterns. But can we see incipient serialism in this painting already? Attempting the Impossible, painted in 1928, and this painting is in Brussels, measures 32 by 41, even when we do see the faces of Magritte's figures, they are bland, unexceptional, reminding us of, actually reminding us of Hopper's automatons. And it's worth pointing out, I think, that Hopper, Magritte and Kiriko were contemporaries. In fact, Magritte and Hopper died in the same year. Magritte's figures are objectified, sharing the same expressionless faces, vacant stares and passive features as if in a trance. Here, a painter painting the figure of a woman on thin air. This woman is life-size, upright, naked, and no less real than the artist in his suit. What artist paints in suits? Notice how the woman throws a shadow, just like the painter, while her flesh 
ceases abruptly where his brush stops. What is going on in this painting is a mystery, and that's precisely what he is painting, a mystery. Why? Well, because perhaps he intends to express that ultimately life is a mystery to us all, or to put it more simply, mystery is all. I think this is quite an engaging painting actually, and I certainly like the fact that the artist is wearing a, a suit, it might be a, um, a, a sort of home, homespun suit, but <laughs> no artist, I, I don't know many artists, but you can imagine that artists would never paint in a suit because within minutes, if it was me anyway, there'd be ink, there'd paint all over it. In fact, the tendency to represent man as a standardized type is typical of several of his works. This rather famous painting is called The Menaced Assassin, painted in 1927. It is, is a large painting. It measures 60 or well, 60 inches. It's five foot, isn't it? Five foot by, by um, 80 inches, which is uh, seven foot something. This, this painting is in New York, and it relies heavily on dream imagery. A murdered woman is seen lying on a couch, blood coming from her mouth. She has been strangled. We can see the um, scarf that he's used to strangle her across her neck there. The eponymous assassin, urbane and immaculately dressed, is about to leave. We know that because his coat and hat are on a chair next, no, oh, sorry. Oh. Right, are on a chair next, um, ne uh, next to where he's standing. However, despite his crime, he's in no hurry and is seen casually listening to music coming from a phonograph in the wings. And this is rather a theatrical painting. There are two armed men, they could be twins, they look almost identical and they wait to apprehend him, we, we have to assume that, as three more men, maybe four actually, there could be another head here hidden by the assassin's shoulder, but anyway, three more men watch from behind this balcony with this lovely tracery, and Magritte has gone to the bother of, and it would be, it would be a bit of a bother to paint all that tracery when everything else is fairly, um, broad brush strokes um, on, this, on the balcony. Despite the absurdity of this scene, there's little doubt that Magritte looked to the old masters for classical symmetry and perspective. Um, well, I leave you to look at that for a moment and make of it what you can. He, he often like makes his mountains look like cones. He's not too bothered about the shape of mountains, really. The Menaced Assassin. In 1923, he left the wallpaper factory to become a freelance poster designer, channeling his creativity into advertising. He continued to earn a living in this way until 1926, when he signed up to a gallery in Brussels. And this enabled him to paint full time until the gallery folded a few years later. The powerful influence of De Chirico can be seen in the recurrence of frames, windows, mirrors, and pictures within mirrors as in the human condition. The distinction between illusion and reality is called into question. Now on first sight, you probably uh, would have seen this as simply a window looking out onto a fairly typical landscape. But then you're confronted by this white line down there and this strange object up here. And you relate those immediately, or your brain would relate those immediately to two of these three legs. And you realize that that is actually a painting on a canvas. And the painting, of course, um, is extended into reality on the, um, on, on the right here. So that we're not quite sure what we're really looking at there. Again, we've got this slight indentation at the, at the uh, left-hand corner of the canvas into the curtain, which is also detailing the fact that it is actually a painting. Rather a clever painting, I think this one is. Why it's called the human condition? 
Well, I'll leave you to work that one out. My Greek, in common with other surrealists, made frequent use of the trompe l'oeil to good effect, uh, and no more so, probably, in this painting. I wonder how many of you thought of the word was, uh, your immediate reaction was to assume you were just simply looking out of a window, and then your brain had to cope with these other, um, as I've said, these other objects until it reinterpreted uh, what you're actually looking at. So that could be the human condition, the way the brain interprets the messages it gets from the optic nerve and tries to rationalize them. Above all, it is a pointlessness and sheer absurdity of his images which defines Magritte, as in The Secret Player. This is painted in 1927. It's in Brussels and is quite a large canvas, measuring five foot one way and nearly eight foot in the other. The curtain drawn back to frame a scene is a common theatrical device in works of this period. Although Magritte distrusted Freud, there are certainly sexual images in this painting. The phallic table legs, for instance, and we saw something similar in an earlier painting where he, uh, where he gave the, the table leg, if that's what you like to call it, an eye and anthropomorphized it. Um, and then we've got this gagged woman in the cupboard suggested a suggestion of suggest can't say my words this morning suggestive of sadomasochism and this strange flying object now dreams of flying according to freud relate to sexual excitement in both sexes it's frustrating to look at this painting for a purpose but you come away with a sense of foreboding occasioned maybe by the innocence of the players at play, apparently unaware of this ugly black object hovering above them and the sinister woman in the cupboard. The desired effect is to make the viewer uneasy. They appear to be playing baseball to me. I'm sure that's a baseball bat, although those don't, those look more like cricket gloves than uh, baseball um, catching gloves to, to my mind. The secret player, well, the secret player presumably is somewhere off the painting um, on the left. Or is the secret player something else altogether? We don't know. Of course, there's always a temptation to interpret Magritte's early serious painting, surrealist paintings as a psychoanalyst might a uh, patient's dreams as in this painting called The Magician's Accomplices, painted in 1926 and measuring 54 by 41. Again, a painting that's in a private collection. On the stage, the magician's trick has decidedly sadistic overtones as they often do. The soaring of a table of a lady in half, of course, is essentially sadistic. And typically, again, we're not allowed to see faces, in fact, Applying dreamlike logic, the suggestion here is that this is the same, this is one and the same woman, and this is one in the same um, tube cut in half. Again, we've got mountains that are more like cones, nicely rounded mountains, and we've got this strange curtain here, which doesn't appear to be attached to anything. Why the figure of the woman? The, part, the, the bottom half of the woman is in net. Uh, we, we just don't know. And of course, the, it, it, they're on a stage with a, with a side, the side to it for some, for some reason. I quite like this colour of the curtain at the back. I suppose that's a cerise. You call, call that colour cerise, maybe. Um, but I think it sets the whole painting off and works well with the brass or gold, golden yellow colour here. In many ways Magritte acts like a conjurer himself and it's no coincidence that he cho chose to portray himself thus in The Sorcerer. This is a small painting, only 13 by 18, painted in 1951, <clears throat> revealing the mystery of everyday unreality. The, you see that he's given himself for arms for some reason best known to himself this painting is actually done in quite a different style we've we, we've lost the slick flat smooth finishes 
and it's 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 uh, I've got to say it's impressionistic in style um, to a degree. The bushwork seems to be quite quick and 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 carefree, and the colours are certainly earthen. So one hand is pouring a drink, the other hand is, has a knife in his in it, and and then a fork in that hand, and then the fourth hand is feeding. So you get through a lot of food if you had four hands very quickly, I would imagine. This painting is called The Midnight Marriage. Well, it's a marriage in the sense that we've got two sort of heads here of, 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 of some description. This painting is in Brussels. It was painted in 1927 and measures um, 54 inches by 42. The man's face is turned away from us and of course the wig it, it doesn't have a face because it's on a, a wig stand and nor should it. The tree in the uh, both trees in fact it, they might be connected the trees but I don't think they are they're upside down you'll notice and the perspective of the pale pink rock or wall is teasing we've got this slight inner side to the wall but then it disappears into the tree so it's it doesn't go anywhere else it's this very very strange shape but then there's nothing strange about Magritte paintings being strange it's a mo it's as though Magritte is defying us to come up with some interpretation that he simply never intended and he does this because it's painted with such precision and perfect technique and it's bonded as well by the color lilac, if you'll notice, even the back, the head, the hair on the back of his head. And um, that could be a wax wax dummy's head, we don't know. But even that is a shade, shaded uh, dark lilac. The mirror is cropped and its reflection is denied to us. Um, so one, one has to wonder why he's put the mirror there at all. I, I did warn you that we would see the Kiriko's apple again, or, or it wasn't an apple, it was a ball, a green ball, but uh, in this case it's an apple. This, this painting is called The Listing Room, it's in private collection and it was painted in 1952. It suggests claustrophobia for those familiar with Alice in Wonderland. Look how beautifully the window is painted here though. What on earth gave him the idea of putting it, of coming of the, of, the, of, the, of the green apple, unless it was other than De Chirico's ball, I suggest it probably was. In 1927, his paintings are less dreamlike and rely more on visual impact for, of phenomena. We know this to be the reversal of normality, a new kind of pictorial statement. Also at this stage in his career, he develops an interest in collage and his work as a commercial artist resumes. This one is called Personal Values, painted in 51, again in private, in private ownership, measured in 32 by 39, and relies on a reversal of scale for its disconcerting, disconcerting and threatening effect. Magritte said in 57, the only thing that engages me is the mystery of the world. Are we looking at papered walls here or are we looking at the sky? The reflections in the wardrobe are deliberately inconsistent. This object here, which looks to me like a bar of soap, or it could be a case for a powder puff even maybe, that is certainly reflected in the wardrobe. But what is this window doing there? Where is the window in the room? It doesn't make sense for that reflection to be there. His job as a wallpaper designer would have taught him how to simulate effects. The wallpapers, for instance, as in this painting, and wood grain is often encountered in his work, like this one called Discovery, painted in 1927. That's a small painting, 20 by 26. And again, we see the influence of his work in the wallpaper factory. The body's woman undergoes a dramatic transmutation. Her flesh becomes wood and the effect is to shock. Magritte seems to enjoy painting the grain of wood. The grain, wood grain, appears quite a lot in, in his paintings. 
the eternal evidence painted in 1930 and again this is in brussels consists of five separate canvases showing parts of a woman's body for this for his women magritte generally used his wife georgette and if you remember back to the hopper talk um hopper uh, exclusively used his wife uh, as a model and it seems um so did magritte by dividing his pictures into sections Magritte was able to counter the surrealist's habit of conflating images normally considered irreconcilable. Instead of cubist-inspired shifts in focus and perspective, something even more uncompromising happens, a break with the traditional notion of composition. Is he suggesting surrealist and cubist women are often difficult to piece together? What is Magritte getting at? In 1927, his, his 1927 one-man exhibition of 50 paintings, including this one, this included this one, the signs of evening. This again is in private ownership, measuring 30 by 25. These mountains are, yet again have an unreal. Um, they're, they're more like sheets draped over some sort of armature, and we've got these these balls that have fallen out of the, of the picture and this strange scroll-like surrounding to the picture uh, and, uh, and all uh, based on this corrugated uh, roof although it's certainly not asbestos it doesn't look asbestos to me and then this painting also it was in the exhibition young girl eating a bird this is quite small, 29 by 38, and this actually is in Dusseldorf at the moment. It's said to be symbolic of the loss of sexual innocence. Well, I'll leave you to work that one out. It's also possible the painting is based on a poem by Paul Nuge entitled The Girl Who Ate Birds. But a more prosaic and probable explanation is that one day Magritte saw his wife eating a chocolate bird and this gave him the idea, though this girl is definitely not Georgette. During the three years he spent in Paris between 1927 and 30, Magritte shows the influence of the Parisian surrealists characterized by the emergence of biomorphic shapes, as in this painting called Intermission painted in 1927 again in private ownership and it's quite a large painting it's 44 by 63 the strange figures and each uh, each one is a conjoined arm and leg and they interact interact like human figures possibly behind the behind the curtain on a stage set or maybe as as though waiting for the second half of a play either way there's something very disturbing about them, especially this, these two, which are the, the one's got his arm around the other one in, a, in some sort of friendly embrace. And then this one standing on one leg and holding, holding the curtain. This one seems to have collapsed. He's got no head, so he's got no mouth, so he can't drink, so he's not drunk. But either way, there's something very disturbing about these these uh, mutated forms. The celestial muscles, and I'm not quite sure where the muscles comes into it, but we can certainly see celestial in the sense that that's the sky. This seems to owe a debt to Magritte's interest in collage work. And I'll leave you to look at this a minute because I've looked at it quite a lot and, and, and it's, it's very difficult to reconcile the elements of the sky which have, have, have sort of flooded out over this ragged walls, uh, 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 for, for, want of, for want of a better description of it, and then ended up on this stage. Um, very strange. And also this wall here reminds me of shadow uh, figures that looks like a dog. Somebody's made a uh, the shadow of a dog with their hands and there's a, is possibly a human head and then that another one another head there or is that a finger pointing downwards i'm not quite sure 
this this on on the right here could almost be a a, a, a horse's head maybe and then we've got this very jagged edge here as though they've been snipped away with scissors um that's a very strange and yet he's given he's given shadows so these although this is actually two-dimensional and and a, a paper would paper of course as in a collage with a collage is good cut away uh, is not too strictly speaking two dimensional but um, and there's no reason why you shouldn't throw a shadow but it seems there's, there's something strange about the, the the two shadows you wouldn't expect this painting to throw these two figures to throw shadows so um, yeah I've looked at this painting a lot and trying to make some headway out of it a bit and maybe I shouldn't maybe I should get out more However, the Paris period is important primarily because of the introduction of words into his pictures. He explores the relationship between objects, their name and their representation. This one is called The Treachery of Images, perhaps the most famous Magritte painting of them all. Um, painted in 1929, measuring two foot by two foot six, uh, this painting is found itself across the Atlantic in Los Angeles. Magritte seems to be saying this is not a pipe, it is the image of a pipe, and which though this is self-evident, he thinks it needs saying. It's as though words designate images of the material world, and then in a way they stand apart, as in a poem, and can replace them, so that the effect is a betrayal. There's something quite philosophic philosophic about that. Ceci n'est pas une pipe. I think he did one or two variations on this um, painting actually, using different objects. In the Magic Mirror 1921, measures 29 by 21 again in private collection, Magritte strives for an affinity between the flesh pink of the biomorph shape and it's written designation, human body, core humane. He forces us to make a connection we wouldn't otherwise make, but to what purpose? Who knows? Strange. In the 1930s, Magritte's conception of his own painting changed. His pictures became pictorial conceits. Instead of colliding incompatible but familiar objects with each other, he seems to be posing hypothetical questions as in the problem of the door in the paint, in this painting, particularly the unexpected, it's called the unexpected answer. Painted in 1933, measuring just under three foot by two foot. This painting's in Brussels. In a lecture given in 1938, he said, the problem of the door called for an opening one could pass through. In the unexpected answer, I showed a closed door in a room. In the door, an irregular shaped opening revealed the night. So we're not looking as I think, as I, I, I always look at this painting and I think the floor finishes there. And actually we're just looking at a very, well, an unlit wall, a, a far wall in that room, but Magritte seems to suggest we're actually looking at the night. And I notice as well the perspective isn't quite right, or maybe it is, I know, I'm not sure. This, this door's slightly on an angle because he's painted in the edge of the frame here, but there's nothing on this side, of course. So it's just slightly on, a, on, an, on an angle. It doesn't appear to be to start with, but it is just slightly on an angle. We've already seen the problem of the window in the human condition. And then there's a problem of the shoes in the red model. Red model? I don't know. There are three versions of this painting. Painted in almost photographic detail, we almost accept what we are seeing as real. So the shoes have become the feet and the feet are an extension of the shoes. 
Magritte said, the problem of the shoes demonstrates how the most frightening thing can, through inattention, become completely innocuous. Thanks to the red model, we realize that the union of the human foot and the shoe is actually a monstrous custom. Do we realize that? It seems the most natural thing in the world to put a shoe on a foot. And so I leave you to work that out yet again. Is Magritte being entirely serious with some of these pronouncements? We know he had a roguish sense of humor. And also notice the well, you can't see them very well because they're very, very small, but he's, there are symbols of transience in the gravel. For instance, he's chosen to depict three um, British coins, uh, uh, current, current coins, obviously. So, where are we, 1937, they'd be George, Georgic coins, wouldn't they? Um, a cigarette end, cigarette butt, a match and a crumpled piece of newspaper. You'll, you, you'll, you'll have to take my word for it because you can't really make these out at, at, this, uh, at this sort of scale. Is, it, <clears throat> is this mocking the pretension of interpretation, do you think? Is he setting a trap for the over-discerning, pompous art critic? I rather feeling there might be something in that. This painting is called Not To Be Reproduced. Um, not to be reproduced in the mirror as a reflection, presumably. Painted in 1937, this painting has found its way into Rotterdam. It's a kind of oblique portrait thought to be of his patron, Edward James, who staged an exhibition devoted mainly to Magritte at his London gallery. Magritte came over for the show, but being famously shy, and he was shy, Magritte, simply waved at James from a distance and then hightailed it back across the channel. Notice how the Edgar Allan book, and, and Edgar Allan is his favourite uh, author, apparently, or was his favourite author, I should say, um, that's faithfully reflected in the mirror, but the reflection, of course, is not. So we don't actually get a portrait in the sense that we don't know what we don't know what he looks like, um, James um, Edward. I wonder, what, I wonder what he thought of this uh, portrait. I'd be interested to know. He probably thought it was fair game, as he knew what he was buying and knew what he was displaying. Living in Belgium through the Second World War radically altered Magritte's attitude to painting. In 1943, he began to paint in a bright, colourful style. He broke with André Breton and renounced surrealism, saying, The sense of chaos, of panic, which surrealism hoped to foster so that everything might be called into question, was achieved much more successfully by those idiots, the Nazis. I painted a picture, the black flag, in 19, 1937. This, this picture, by the way, it hangs in Edinburgh. So he, he goes on to say, I painted a picture of the black flag, which gave a foretaste of the terror which would come from missiles, and I'm not proud of it. Against widespread pessimism, I now propose a search for joy and pleasure. And so his emphasis on colour became known as his Renoir period. And it lasted about four years. This painting called Premeditation is typical, but of course it's not the sort of style that we know Magritte for or that Magritte is famous for. Uh, we would struggle to identify that as a Magritte, I think. It's said that something a trifle flat, that there was something a trifle flat about the imagery of it in, in his paintings of the 50s and 60s, when he became more absorbed in painting variations of his early work. In the 60s, public interest in Magritte increased enormously, and there were two major retrospectives, one in New York in 65 and one in Rotterdam in the year of his death in 67. I'll leave you with this final picture another portrait called The Pleasure Principle, and typically the 
title tells us nothing. And it's another portrait of Edward James, his patron. I've shown you this particularly because it sold two years ago for 18 million pounds. We just can't say whether that is an, ac an accurate representation of the likeness, but presumably he was aiming for something else with that fireball that he's created on, the, on top of his neck. Um, uh, but I'm not sure what it was. Uh, as I said, there's no attempt to capture James's likeness. And um, perhaps that's the point, because that's how Magritte painted. <laughs>